welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. Oh, there's a man walking at me. Oh, <laughs> okay. So I'll give you my coat. Give it to that blonde there. She's always cold. And um, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. So let's just put our hearts before the Lord and let the Lord speak to us. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman, tall man, short man, old man, young man, black man, white man, brown man. We haven't done that, Lord. We've come in to hear from the Holy Spirit, teacher of the church. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that the Father would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all of the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives this day. As you bless us, Lord, we're grateful. But you know what, Lord? Bottom line, we want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you bless them also, Lord? Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans. Methodist, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia, Church, The Way. We thank you, Father, for San Bernardino Temple. Our Catholic brothers and sisters, Adventist brothers and sisters, bless them, Lord, as you would bless us, and God will give you the praise, give you the glory. You know why, Lord? Because we're in the building of the kingdom business together. Not a man's kingdom, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. We're all in agreement with a great big shout. We say, Amen. Amen. I'm glad you're here. This has been a really busy weekend and week for us. And we're taking a sidestep away from Hebrews. For those of you that don't know what that means, that you're new here, we go line upon line, precept upon precept in the word of God. But this day, because of yesterday and Pastor Frank preaching at our Saturday morning service, we're going to just take a sidestep away and we're going to go to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. In 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, we see a story that's not just a story about David and Goliath. It's a story about you. It's a story about me. The title of today's message is Facing the Battles of Life. If you're ever going to do anything, you need to know that you will be in a battle to get it done. Don't think for a moment that building a business is easy. Don't think for a moment that building a great marriage is just going to happen. Don't think raising kids in this day and age or this economy is going to be easy. You're going to be in a battle in every area of your life. There are areas of your life that are going to try to stop you and hinder you and keep you from ever getting involved in the things of God, sit back as a spectator and never do anything and never accomplish anything and foolishly never be what God would have you to be and never do what God would have you to do. There's a different quality inside of those that are born of the Spirit of God, a quality, if you will, of God himself. The Bible says that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. Nothing is impossible. But at times when you're facing battlegrounds and battle situations, it will seem like you cannot win. It'll seem like you're going to fail. And in the natural, and I want to say that again, I want to repeat myself. In the natural, you probably would fail, but you are bringing into the natural the supernatural. And when you bring the supernatural into the natural, you now have supernatural results. And that's what we see in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. It's a wonderful story about a young man who was a nobody that nobody knew by the name of David, whom God selected from the hills of Judea, who became the greatest king Israel has ever known. 
doubling the size of Israel, doubling the economy of Israel, bringing import-export to Israel and prosperity to the land, but more importantly, brought a heart for God back to the people. A great king by the name of David who started out learning, this, is, this will drive you wild, listen to this, learning to be a king as he became a shepherd on the hills of Judea. There on those hills, God saw his heart. There on those hills in this boring, mundane, monotonous job of shepherding that God saw who he was, saw the very character of his heart and said, I can use that man in a great and mighty way. And God looks today at your heart. God looks at your life and sees the development of your heart and your life and wants to take you beyond your own understanding and own thoughts to a greater level. I've said it before, I'll say it again. There's a promised land for each and every one of us. And I'm not talking about just heaven, I'm talking about here on earth that God wants you to accomplish and be and fulfill the plan of the Lord. God has a plan for your life beyond that which you could ever think you could imagine that you could ever accomplish. And as you look at these verses that we're going to see today, there's some characteristics in the heart of David that you will see and you'll see in this battle with Goliath that'll be very similar to, to the one you're going to be having as you face your future and face the problems of your future. I want to start off with verse number one, 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. It says simply now, and I'm going to go through the verses. There's not any points. There's not that usual point one, point two, point three. We're just going to simply talk about verses today. Listen closely because we're talking about you. We're talking, listen closely, about your life. Listen closely because we're talking about your future. And that's what this word is here for. In verse number one, it gives us great insight on what's taking place. It says, now the Philistines gathered the armies together to battle. There's always going to be resistance, and you might as well understand that. There's always going to be someone going to try to stop you from being and doing what God would have you to be and do. You're never going to just, as I said earlier, have a great marriage without fighting for a great marriage. Never going to raise great kids without fighting for a great kids. You're never going to have a good business that goes to a great business without fighting for it. There's a battle going to take place. The battle is not just talking about a story about God or David. The battle, again, is talking about a story about you. The verse goes on, and let me read to you, if I may, just for a few moments. And let me explain what takes place. And it says, And Saul and the men, verse number two of Israel, were gathered together. They encamped in the valley of Elah and drew near to battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood at verse number three on the mountainside of one side and, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and the valley was between them. So if you just picture the battleground, two hills, two armies and a valley down below, they're going to meet down in this valley and they're going to fight at this level area. And it's all there for a reason. Now, the next part of these verses is going to introduce the enemy. His name is Goliath. It's interesting that it's talking about Goliath and describing Goliath. He's a massive man, a murdering, massive murderer, trained, highly skilled technician in murder. And the Bible starts to describe him because the very first thing you're going to understand about a battle that you will be facing is the intimidation that wants to come against you and cause you to fear. I don't care. You'll never stand in faith for health. You'll never stand in faith for life. You'll never stand in faith for business and economics until you get past the intimidation of the natural world. And Goliath represents that, and that's why God describes Goliath and who he is. Let me describe him to you as I read, if I may, by looking at verse, if you will, four, verse number four. And the champion went out, and the champion of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, 
whose height was six cubits and a span. Stop right there. He's almost 10 feet high. It's estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 pounds of solid muscle. Tradition tells us that they were so mean they would take files and file their teeth to a point that if he got in a scrap with you on the ground, he'd bite you to death while you bled to death. I'm six foot five when I was young. When I was middle aged, I was six foot four. <laughs> now I'm about four foot seven. <laughs> but this man is 10 feet high, and he's a murdering machine. And it's being described so that you can understand that you, like David, would have the right and the justification to back off, be alone, and not get involved. Why would anybody want to get involved with something that really doesn't personally have anything to do with them? And that's the key to the heartbeat of God. God's waiting to see if people will put their life on the line and get involved. And you will find that this murdering machine, let me read it to you again. Verse number five, it goes on and says, and his bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. In other words, this whole thing is like a wire mesh around him that nothing could get through and nothing could kill him. And it weighed more than most men could even weigh. Themselves. Verse number six, and then he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. And now the staff and the spear were like a weaver's beam and the iron uh, spearhead weighed 600 shekels and, 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 and the uh, shield bearer went before him. And he stood and he cried out, verse number eight, to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, why have you come out to the line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistines? In other words, why don't you come out and fight? Am I not your enemy? He will intimidate you with his looks. The enemy will intimidate you with their size. The, imitate, the enemy will intimidate you with their ability. They, they will intimidate you with words. Until your heart finally faints, you give up and quit and not get involved. Not go forward, not fight a battle, but back off. And he goes on, he says, am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Can I just say something? Right there, there's a mistake being said. These are not servants of Saul. They should not be servants of Saul, the king of Israel. They are servants of the Most High God. When you lose the perspective of who you are, you are now subject to the natural battle instead of bringing in the supernatural battle. You are not a servant of Saul, the king of Israel. You are a servant of the Most High God. And he comes along and he makes this statement, choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me, in verse number nine. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. There's no doubt that whoever is coming is going to die. I want you to hear this. There's no mercy with the enemy. He wants to take you out. The Bible says the thief comes but to rob, steal, and kill and destroy. He wants to stop you completely. He doesn't want to play games with you. He doesn't want to give you a little insight. He doesn't want to pat you on the back. He doesn't want to extend mercy to you. He doesn't want to break your leg. He doesn't want to break your arm. He wants to kill you, kill your family, kill your children, stop your business, stop your life, keep you from ever being what God would have you to be. But I'm here today to tell you there's a greater one on the inside of you that's got to rise up big and take these giants out. The same exact attack happens over and over again in our lives and in our marriage with our children and our family and our future and our destiny. Verse number 10 comes along and the Philistine said, 
I defy the armies of Israel with stay. Give me a man that we may fight together. Verse number 11 says, And Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistines, and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. How many of you realize when the Bible says that all of Israel, even King Saul, was greatly afraid, they were afraid. When fear comes in, it will stifle you. You cannot allow fear to come in. God says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but I have given you a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. We don't live live by the craziness of this world and the vanity of this world, but we live by the wisdom of God because God gave us the mind of Christ. We don't have to be afraid. Somebody ought to say amen. And here we find that the first thing they're doing is they have swallowed the bait of intimidation. They've seen his size. They've seen the way he fights and the way he looks. They know his track record. It is an obvious decision to not get involved, get away. They've heard his cursings and they've heard his words and they believe it and now they're in fear. Instead of in faith, they're in horrible fear. Now David comes on the scene. Here's David, young David is asked by his father to go take bread to his older brothers that are in this battle with the Philistines. David's on the hills of Judea with the sheep. Most amazing thing about David is he's already been anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king over Israel and to take King Saul's place. But instead of exalting himself after Samuel anointed him to be king, he goes back to the sheep because that's where he knows he needs to be. Me and you, we would have been different. We would have sold our CDs for $500 each. We would have had a meeting at Anaheim Convention Center with T-shirts with our picture on it. After all, we're the future king going to be. And therefore, we would have said to our father, Jesse, Jesse, have your servants go take care of those little bit of sheep on the hills of Judea. I'm not doing it. I'm the future king of Israel. But not David. He's got this heart. And the heart is that he cares about something that's seemingly so insignificant, the sheep himself, that even after he is anointed by the great prophet Samuel, he goes back to the sheep. There his father finds him and sends him with cheese and bread to his brothers that are in the battle with the Philistines. As he comes onto the battle scene, he hears Goliath. And Goliath is saying the same things he just got through saying saying, hey, you guys, send me somebody. You send me somebody, we'll be your servants. And he's defying the armies of Israel. And listen to the words, if you will, of David. I'm gonna jump ahead on these so that you might see them and understand them. Verse number 25, let's go to verse number 24. And all of the men of Israel that saw this man fled from him and they were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, how have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy, the, uh, defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. And David spoke to the men and he makes this statement. He says, and who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is, now listen to these prophetic words. Listen to the strength of this young boy who was a shepherd boy who didn't have to get involved at all. He says these words, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He should, that he should defy the armies of the living God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You say, what does that mean? It means who is this man that has not a God? That he should defy not the armies of Israel, not the followers of Saul, but the armies of the living God. In other words, David sees things differently. Stop right there. You have the ability to see the outcome and see things 
differently because you have the heart of God on the inside of you. You have the mind of Christ working on the inside of you. All you have to do is get past this world's intimidation, all the problems and pressures that look like they want to stop you. And get your eyes back on the God that created the heavens and the God that created the earth. I want you to know something. In order for you to fail, in order for David to fail, the, this, this uncircumcised Philistine is going to have to go through God to get through David. That isn't going to happen. He's going to have to go through God to get to you. And that isn't going to happen. Are you following me? Who is this uncircumcised Philly that defies the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same manner so that it shall be done for man who kills him. Now here's an interesting thing on verse number 28. Verse 28, it says, As now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard and spoke to this man, and Eliab's anger was aroused, not against the Philistine, against David. you got to be kidding me. Then the brother comes along and he makes this statement. Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride, your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Do you ever realize that oftentimes your stand for God will be resisted by people? Not only resisted by people, they'll be resisted by your own family. Your family ought to be on your side. And I want you to know oftentimes it's not the case. I remember a young man coming in and he was a guy that was so loaded with drugs and was so hung up on drugs, so addicted to drugs. He used to take a hammer, he told me, and broke his teeth out of his mouth so that he could go to the dentist and get drugs to overcome his problem. That's how bad he was. I don't know what happened. He came to church, got saved, got delivered. Man, he was set free. He used to steal from his mom and dad, used to steal from his brother's relatives, used to break into his house, steal everything, break his teeth out, totally addicted. I'll never forget the words. He says, I went home to my mom and dad. I told them that I got born again and I'm saved and I'm free. I'm no longer doing drugs. They looked at me and said, we much rather have you a drug addict than a Christian. I want you to know something. Oftentimes, the own family will come against your stand with God. You've got to get your eyes off your own family and keep your eyes on God, the almighty God who's going to one that's got your future at hand. <laughs> David makes this statement. He says, what have I done now? In other words, see the word now there? In other words, these brothers have been on him a long time. They've accused him about a lot of stuff. They've criticized him and belittled him before. So now he says, now what have I done? But he makes a most interesting statement. He says, is there not a cause? Now there is a reason why you are what you are. Is there a reason why you want to go to where you want to go, be what you want to be, say what you want to say? Is there a reason? Is there a cause? Is Jesus not worth standing up for? Is Jesus not worth fighting for? Is Jesus not worth investing your heart and your life into? Come on, is there not a cause? Man, if there's not a cause for you to stand for God, then the world will come and take everything out of you. But if there is a cause why you should stand against and resist this enemy. I want you to know something. There's a cause and his name is Jesus and he is worth it. Come on somebody. The words that David spoke got back to King Saul. King Saul makes a statement to him in verse number 32 and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistines. Well, wait a minute. Nobody else is going to go fight with this Philistine. Here's this David going to fight with the Philistine. What for, David? You were on the hills of, the, hills of Judea with your father's sheep. Why get involved? Samuel has already anointed you king. It'll happen someday. Why get involved? I mean, David, why not just back off? Let somebody else take the responsibility. Isn't it King Saul's responsibility, seeing he's the tallest man in Israel to face the tallest man in the Philistine army? 
Why are you getting involved, David? Back off. You see, your mind will tell you things like that always. You will always have a reason to justify why not to do what God would have you to do. Let me say it again because you just missed it. There will always be a reason. There will always be a, 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 a some situation that will come up on the inside of you so that you can make the excuse not to get involved in the cause that God has set before you. There's always justification. He's too big. He's too strong. Nobody else is doing it. My big brothers aren't doing it. King Saul isn't doing it. The warriors of Israel ought to do this. Why do I have to get involved? But David sees it differently. David gets involved in that which is right. He doesn't get involved in that which he thinks he ought to do. He gets involved and he knows what is right. And it's the cause of the armies of God. Amen. May I say this to us? All of us can make excuses every day for not doing what we ought to do. Doing what's right. But that's what made David so special. He got involved in stuff that nobody else would have ever known. And he says, don't let any man's heart fail because of this big dummy that's standing there yelling and screaming at us. I'll go fight him myself. That is an amazing statement. Then here comes King Saul. You would think King Saul would go, wow, that's great. Go do it, man. I don't want to do it. Here's what King Saul says in verse number 33. And Saul said to David, you're not able. So here's not only his brothers saying you're not able. Here's his family saying you're not able. Here's the giant himself saying you're not able. But here's his king saying you're not able. He goes on in verse number 33. He says, you're not able to go against the Philistine and fight with him. For you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, your servant used to, I love these words, keep his father's sheep. Listen to these words. And when the lion and the bear came and took the lamb out of the flock. Now here you got to get the picture. David's father is named Jesse. He's one of the richest men in the area. The sheep that are grazing are in the hills of Judea, just outside of Jerusalem, the best grazing territory there is. And here is David watching his father's sheep. A lion comes in and takes a lamb. A bear comes in and takes a lamb. It's literally, the lamb is literally in the mouth of the lion and the bear. Can I ask you a question? If a lamb was in the mouth of a lion or a bear with those fangs and those teeth, don't you think he's holding on to that sheep? Don't you think there's a penetration of the skin? Don't you think there's blood all over the place as the lion grabs down on the sheep? I would think there would be. That sheep is a lost cause. He's over with, finished for him. That lamb is worthless. He's gone. He's dead. But not to a man who has integrity. Not to a man who has a heart to do what's right. Not to a man who wants to get involved in what's right. Not just sit back, not get involved. It might be something like this with me. I might have said to the lamb, and, uh, and sorry, bud, too bad. You're already in the mouth of the lion. I'm certainly not going to fight that lion for you. He's going to come after me and kill me. I'm not going to kill that bear. Just take that lamb and get out of here and don't let my dad see me. He'll never know there's one gone. And that's what most of us would have done in this room. But not David. What made him so special is he got involved in stuff that most people wouldn't have gotten involved in. And he makes the statement. And listen to what the statement is in verse number 35. I went after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. 
The lamb is in the mouth of the lion. The lamb is in the mouth of the bear. And then he comes along and he says this. He says, and when it arose against me. In other words, the lamb is in the mouth. And here comes the lion. And here comes the bear. And he's coming after me. And when he arose, it's come. Have you ever had a dog chase you and you run like you can't imagine? Can you imagine what it must have been having a lion chase you? Or a bear chase you? You would be really fast getting out of there and you know it. David does it. This kid is weird. David does something. He says, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and killed it. All because he believed. And the God behind him could do it. Not putting up with his stuff. Not laying down. Not being intimidated. Not being lied to. Not, you know, not uh, being a place of so afraid I can't do anything. But got in and made something happen. So many of us want something to happen. But we're afraid to get in and make it happen. If he don't make it happen, the bear and the, and the lion are going to win and the lamb is going to die. Now Jesus comes and he sees us in the mouth of the devil and he comes to the cross, dies on the cross for us that are worthless and lost just like the lamb. Jesus had the same heart as David had. You and I have got to get a picture of having this kind of a heart that does what's right no matter what it costs us. And if our own life is that line, I know this, that Deborah and I, when we started this church, she's such a great woman of God, she was following this crazy man. She said to me, because we had given up our business, paid the bills of this church for three years, never took up an offering. We just worked and paid the bills of this church. Didn't have any business, gave up all my, those were the most prime years of development and business. My whole life gave it up. She said, are you sure you're doing the right thing? I said, Mama, I'd much rather go broke trying for Jesus than to have all the money in the world and have never tried to build the kingdom of God. She said, I'm on your side. Let's go. Sometimes you're just going to have to put yourself on the line for the things of God. I'm out of time. I want to just tell you, I, there's so much more. If you want more, you'll have to get my Bible college class called Cardiology 101. But I love this. You know the story. David makes a statement as he faces Goliath later on in the story. And he says to Goliath, you come to me in verse number 45. You come to me with sword, with spear, with javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, and whom you have defied. In verse number 46, he says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give your carcass to the... Uh, to the uh, carcass, to the camp of the Philistines and the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. There is a God at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. <laughs> And we do what we do because he's God. The world may know. That's why we feed the people. That's why we're there taking these risks. That's why we have missionaries around the world. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why people's lives are being changed. And God wants to do a great and mighty and marvelous thing in your life. The same God that backed David is the same God that day in and day out wants to back you. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. I'm here to tell you today that you will face problems, trials, and tribulations. All hell will come against you. Don't think it unusual, the Bible says. Just stand up and know 
that it's come against you in the natural, trying to intimidate you and cause you to be worried and full of fear. But you have a God on the inside and nothing can stop him. Take the head of the giant. Take the head of the giant and move past into the victory that God has for you all. That's what God spoke to me to tell you about this weekend. If God spoke to you this weekend, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. So true. The story is about you. It's there about you. It's your call. Will you get involved or not? Will you sit back timidly and do nothing? David could have made a million excuses. What do I got to do with this? Let those big stupid brothers of mine fight this guy. Let Saul, who thinks he's a big shot, fight it. David got involved. Let the lion have the sheep. Let the bear have the sheep. All of us are going to have to make decisions in everything that we do in life. Are we going to do what God wants us to do? Or are we going to do what we think that we rationalize and justify that we don't have to do? What a difference in life. Again, wave at me if God spoke to you. I want to know if God spoke to you today. Come on, one more time, let's give him a great big praise. We do that. Thank you, Jesus. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Could I ask you all just to remain seated? Come on, everybody. Just sit down for a moment because this is the most important part of the entire service. Let the ushers finish up what they need to do. And give me just a moment. Will you give me a little grace? And I want to talk to some of you that are in here today because it's very important that you hear my words so I don't want anybody to get up, walk around, be disturbing. Listen closely to what is being said. Nothing in this world could be worse than you coming in here singing songs, listening to the word of God today, and you were great listening to the word of the Lord, walking out of this building towards your car, your heart stops, bang, you die, and you go to hell. Nothing could be worse than that. Today, listen closely. Don't let anything disturb you. Let the ushers take care of what they need to take care of back there. Thank you, ushers. Don't want you to do that. I want you to be right with God. So I'm going to ask you some questions. If that's all right. Let them deal with it. Don't you know, just right during this period of time, there will always be a disturbance. This is called problems that are keeping some of your attention back there instead of listening to me. Because your eternal life is at stake. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. You do not get to heaven because you are a nice person. You do not get to heaven because you're sweet and kind. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian, took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you say you love God. Listen to me. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Then he comes along and he makes the statement and he tells us exactly in Scripture exactly how to get to heaven. We're never going to get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And he makes it very clear, and I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. Very important for you to understand. I don't care if you've joined a church, you were there for 14 years and raised in the church, sang in the choir, helped the pastor, carried his Bible, and taught Sunday school. If you don't do things God's way, you're going to die and go to hell. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. And I love you, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. In order for you to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven Jesus' way. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when I use the term born again, a lot of people in American churches just turn off. The reason they turn off is because 
We've been trained by Hollywood that born again people are idiots, fools, radicals, and fanaticals, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Let me explain to you what born again means because most people that attend American churches today don't really know what born again means. Let me tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. It means that you have given God all of your heart. It means you have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down. It's all or nothing and I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Last book in the Bible, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And you know he is. He says, I'm coming again and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. My goodness, what kind of a rude, crude statement is that? And what did he really mean by that? If I come and find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What he just really said is people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're not gonna make it. Lukewarm, let me define it for you. A little in, a little out. Lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Watch this, watch this. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something like everything else in your life. But he'll never be something until you make him everything. That's lukewarm, by the way. And some of you have been walking on both sides of the fence and you need to get off and walk in the wholehearted for the Lord. And giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. I can't make you do it, only you can. This is a divine appointment. God had brought you here today for that reason, to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Today you have an option. You can either head for heaven or you can head for hell. It's your call. You must be born again. You're gonna have to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. Notice how I emphasize the word give. Give means give. He won't steal it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He could make a trillion robots that look just like you to, to worship him, but he doesn't. He gave you a free will choice. It's in your choice whether you're gonna give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. You see, I already know you know who Jesus is. You already have had knowledge. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. I already know you know who Jesus is. But that won't get you to heaven, head knowledge, because it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? And today is your day of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, I'm not sure where I'm at. Then let's make sure. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I give God all my heart? How do I give God all my life? Well, let's don't do it your way or my way. Let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. I'll go bang when you hear that sound. Bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You put it right back down. That's simple. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart. Hold on, we'll do it all at the same time. Hands already going up. We'll, we'll do it all at the same time. Uh, I, he says, I, 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 when you raise your hand, here's what you're saying. I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. All across this auditorium, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. You've never given him all of your heart. You know who you are. I'm speaking to you. Today is your day of salvation. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Today, maybe you prayed with Billy Graham. Maybe you prayed at a Harvest Crusade. That's great. But did you follow up with all of your heart and life? Or was it just a little magical abracadabra formula you call a prayer? It won't work and it won't get you in heaven until your life follows your words. Come on, today is your day. I'm counting to three, I've done my job, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Sit back and do nothing, 
and God will do nothing. Or get out of yourself and do what's right. Just like David did what's right and make the commitment. You say, Pastor, if you want me to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be embarrassed. People around you might see you, but who cares what people think? It's more important than what God sees. And today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three, I've done my job, here it is. Get ready to pop your hand up all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, wherever you're at, down at Love Rock Kuka's restaurant. I'm telling you right now, today is your day of salvation down at the Love Rock restaurant. Today, put the burrito down. I'm talking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. God's watching you right now. All across this world on the internet live, you can today make that commitment of all of your heart and all of your life. Today is your day. I'm counting. Here it is. One. Two, three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, thank you, 13, 14, thank you, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, thank you, back over here, 26, 27, thank you, 28, back over here, 29, back up on top over here, thank you, 29, where are you, 30, if there's 29, there's 30 right there, there's 31 back over here, 32, 33, thank you, God, 34, 35, back here. Anybody else real quick, going for Jesus today. 35, there's somebody else over there. 36, there's another one over here. 37, 38, thank you. God bless you. If there's 38, can you just feel 38 and 9? I'm real stingy. I just got to get 39 and 40. Where are you, 39 and 40? You know you're sitting there saying, I wish this big mouth old man would shut up. Guess what? I'm, I, I'm going to shut up in a minute, and then you'll be sad. You'll wish you'd raise your hand. Where are you, 39 and 40, that should have raised your hand? You don't want to be what? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 38. Isn't God good? Real quick. Real quick. Real quick. Real quick. All 38 of you, I got to do something. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get out of your seat. I want you to get your stuff. No one leaves the auditorium during this period of time. But all 38 of you, you got to hustle, okay? You got to hustle. Get out of your seat. Meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, you raise your hand. Get down here. Thank you guys for coming. God bless you. Everybody in front, look over to your left. This is Pastor Joel waving at you. He's going to do three things real quick. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart, give you some free stuff now that you're a Christian, what to do next. And then you know what he's going to do? Introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll tell you what that means. We don't want you to go back, fall through the cracks. We want you to go on with God. Let us help you to do that. You said you're going to give God all of your heart, all of your life. He'll explain what a personal uh, spiritual trainer is all about and how it works. It's absolutely free. It's absolutely fun. You'll benefit from it. It is great. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.